Mixing some kind of pre-ferment into your dough will absolutely improve the flavor and texture of fresh baked bread. And it's a procedure that makes all the sense in the world for professional or otherwise large scale bakeries. But for those of us just baking one or two loaves at a time at home, you can simply mix up your whole dough in one go as normal, throw it in the refrigerator to age overnight, and you will get basically the same effect. I've long suspected this might be the case, but now I've done the systematic testing to prove it to my own satisfaction. I'ma show you. My base recipe is gonna be a pretty wet dough, something like a ciabatta, a cup of water, 237 mils, a teaspoon of dry yeast, a teaspoon of kosher salt, and normally I'd stir in just enough bread flour to get me a dough instead of a paste. But because we're doing science today, I'll weigh out 260 65 grams to be consistent. That'll be 90% hydration, the weight of the water divided by the weight of the flour. Just stir that together, then let it sit and autolyze for about 15 minutes. Let your water break down your flour and it will require much less kneading. I'm just gonna do a stretch and fold. I do this in the sink so that I can easily keep my hand wet, which will keep the dough from sticking to me. Stretch and fold until the gluten tightens up and it stops being stretchable. Just a few stretches. In the refrigerator to ferment slowly overnight. Now for comparison, I'll mix up my pre-ferments. Technically, sourdough starter is a kind of pre-ferment, but that's a different thing. That takes weeks to get going, it ends up tasting really different. I find that nowadays when people talk about a pre-ferment, usually they mean something they whip up the night before with a little bit of commercial yeast. Of those pre-ferments, there's the French model, which is named after the Polish, which is why it's called Poolish. Generally a very wet pre-ferment, like 100% hydration. And then there's the Italian model, which is named after chariots for some reason. Biga means chariot. Biga is generally a little bit drier, like 60% hydration. For the sake of these experiments, I'm going for a pre-ferment hydration somewhere in the middle, and usually use a tiny amount of yeast for a pre-ferment because they're gonna have all night at room temperature to reproduce. That was like 1 16th of a teaspoon. I'll mix in my flour, and wouldn't you know it, my mother ciabatta recipe is 90% hydration, which is between a poolish and a biga, so I can just whip up a miniature version of my final dough and that'll make the math way easier on me tomorrow. I won't have to account for an excess of water or flour in my pre-ferment. This is just one quarter of my final dough with less yeast and no salt. People usually don't put salt in pre-ferment. Salt can affect gluten and fermentation. Small amount probably wouldn't do very much, but just to be safe, I'm gonna add the salt all at once tomorrow because that's easy to do, so I will. Pre-ferment generally accounts for between a quarter and a half of your final dough. So, for another experiment, I'll whip up half of my dough as pre-ferment. We'll make a loaf with one quarter pre-ferment and another with one half pre-ferment. Another thing I've always wondered, why so little yeast inside a pre-ferment? People say that if you put in like a whole teaspoon of yeast in the pre-ferment, you'll get too much fermentation as it sits at room temperature overnight. But too much fermentation is not a concept that exists in my culture. So I'm gonna whip up some pre-ferments with a lot of yeast, about as much yeast as you would use if you were just baking bread the quote unquote normal way. And we should acknowledge that the normal way isn't normal, historically speaking. People didn't have little yeast granules or even brewer's yeast until relatively recently. Historically, bread dough was kinda like fire. It was something that ancient people tried to keep going in perpetuity. Without matches, it's really hard to make fire from scratch, even if you have a flint. So, ancient societies would have generally avoided the work by keeping some hot coals from last night's fire to ignite the next night's fire. Similarly, once people got a good wild yeast culture going, they probably would have used it to mix up the dough for their daily bread, and then they would have held back some of that dough to mix up tomorrow's dough. And thus, this whole pre ferment procedure is kind of a modern recreation of how some people have baked bread for centuries. It's the next morning, and before we bake, I could use a cup of coffee from Trade, sponsor of this video. I've got a special deal today. Get a free bag of coffee plus $5 off any three or four bag subscription when you sign up using my code, which is Ragusia5. Trade partners with dozens of the top independent coffee roasters in the US. Ooh, Portrait Coffee from the West End in Atlanta. I know them. You just tell Trade 
trade the kind of flavors you like, whether you want pre-ground or whole bean, etc. And Trade has their roasters send you bag after freshly roasted bag. Ultimately, you are patronizing local independent businesses. Trade is just handling the discovery for you. They champion roasters who hold high ethical and sustainable sourcing standards. I just love getting something new and interesting in the mail every week or two, and man, does it make a difference being freshly roasted. That one has a deep nutty flavor. Just hit my link in the description and use my special code that I've got today, Ragusia5. You'll get a free bag plus $5 off any three or four bag subscription. Thank you, Trey. Anyway, the pre-ferments have been rising all night at room temperature. The ones with a tiny amount of yeast and the ones with a ton of yeast ended up about the same volume, though the one with a lot of yeast smells much stronger. It smells fruity and sour and boozy, all of which is typical of extra fermentation. The normal pre-ferment with a tiny pinch of yeast just kind of smells like bread. It's 25% of my final dough volume, so I will give it the remaining water in my recipe. All of the salt, remember no salt in the pre-ferment, and the remaining three quarters of the flour from my recipe recipe. No more yeast. All of the yeast we need have been growing in the pre-ferment all night. One thing I don't like about working with a pre-ferment is that it's kind of hard to mix in with more flour and water, but just keep stirring and it will come together. I'll let that auto lice 15 minutes, take it over to the sink and do a quick stretch and fold, and then I will let it rise. Same with all my other samples, let rise about two hours, stretch and fold one more time to redistribute the yeast and develop the gluten a little more. I'm gonna bake these on parchment paper because they're so sticky. Thanks again to my viewer who told me to crumple up my parchment so that it lays in whatever shape I want. Dump out the doughs on top and let them proof for about a half an hour so they bake up puffy in the oven. I'm sure I can fit two of these at a time inside a single Dutch oven. The oven just traps steam and gets you a more professional crust. And scoring is probably pointless for a dough this wet, but I'll do it anyway. I'll bake at 500 Fahrenheit, 260C, for about 40 minutes or until the loaves look almost done. Then I'll take the lid off for the last 10 minutes or so to let them brown, and here we are. Not the most professional looking loaves I've ever made, but good enough for a simple flavor experiment. Here's one I mixed up fresh this morning. No pre-ferment, no aging in the refrigerator overnight. It's just a teaspoon of dry yeast, salt, water, and flour. Let it rise for two hours at room temperature, fold, stretch, bake. This baked up kind of flat and it has the softest, least crispy crust of the bunch. The flavor is okay, but it's a little bit bland. That is the quote unquote normal bread. Here's the bread we've leavened with 25% low yeast pre-ferment. The color is a little lighter, but that's probably just due to its position in the oven and the pot and such. The crust is noticeably crispier and the crumb is lighter and the flavor is fuller. A pre-ferment gets you all of the intense flavors of extra fermentation, but it combines it with the superior structural properties of a freshly mixed dough. Extra fermentation kind of weakens gluten and that can affect the texture of the dough. You combine the two together, you get the best of both worlds. And in my opinion, things get even better when we crack open the loaf that was made with 50% low yeast pre-ferment. This is just more of the good stuff, in my opinion, more of those funky fermented flavors that I basically live for. This one is 25% high yeast pre-ferment. Traditionally, people use only a tiny pinch of yeast. The pre-ferment here had like half a teaspoon of yeast in it. The crumb is a little denser, which you could say is bad, but I prefer the flavor. This is the pre-ferment that was so fermented it smelled fruity, and I love those flavors in the bread. Obviously, I am not a pro baker. Pro bakers are often warning about the dangers of over-fermentation. They say that it results in a dense and gummy crumb, which is bad. They also say that it results in kind of a funky, sour flavor that is unpleasant, and that I do not understand at all. I love the funk. We want the funk. Gotta have that funk. This one is 50% high yeast pre-ferment. The crumb inside is verging on being wet and gummy. I definitely couldn't push the fermentation any further, but the flavor is awesome in my book. It's starting to taste like sourdough. Indeed, if I take some equal quantities of water and tear off equal chunks of bread from a couple of my samples, and if I steep them in the water for a while, the solution of my quote unquote normal bread has a pH of 6.6, .6, which is close to a neutral seven. This is my 50% high yeast pre-ferment, and the pH is 6.4, which is noticeably more acidic. 
Extra fermentation lowers pH, and that can inhibit browning a little bit and can make the crumb a little dense and gummy, but it gets you a lot of really strong flavor. It's all about striking a balance. What I've learned here is that I can use lots of pre-ferment in my bread, and I can use more yeast than conventional wisdom would dictate in that pre-ferment, and I will get results that I am happy with. But probably the best loaf of the bunch is the one I just mixed up normally the night before with a teaspoon of yeast, and I let the whole dough sit overnight in the fridge. I stretched and folded it the next morning, I let it proof a half an hour, and then I baked. Nice dark and crispy crust, beautiful fluffy crumb inside, and the flavor has pretty much the same fermented notes and slight acidity that I enjoyed with the best of the loaves I made with pre-ferment. The refrigerator simply slows down fermentation, and it gets you the same combination of attributes you get from mixing a room temperature pre-ferment with fresh flour and water. So why do professional bakers use pre-ferments? Are they stupid? No, it makes total sense to use pre-ferment in a commercial context. In a commercial context, if you're gonna mix up all of your bread doughs for the next day's business and then age them in a refrigerator overnight, you would need a giant walk-in fridge in order to do that. It's much more efficient to mix up a smaller quantity of pre-ferment and then just stick it in a room temperature closet to age overnight. Plus, you can make lots of different styles of bread from that same single batch of pre-ferment. In the home kitchen, it's totally different. I'm only making one loaf of bread. I've got room for it to age in the refrigerator, so I just mix up the dough all in one go with lots of yeast, age it in the fridge, forget about it for a little while. Whenever I wanna bake, pull it out, stretch it, proof it, bake it, really good. Overnight gets you a great result, though if you go up to a week in the fridge, it starts to taste like legit sourdough, but that's a topic for another day.